share with me in the responsive call to worship. Comes up there. Come, neighbours and strangers. Those who need a helping hand. And those who are suffering to God. Whether your faith is weak or strong. Come, let us be neighbours in this place. And let us worship God together. Let us pray. God of love and compassion, you call us to be people of compassion too, to experience in our living the lives of others, to laugh with their joys and cry with their sorrows. In this time of worship, speak to us again your words of love, and remind us again of what it needs, means to be a neighbour. We pray in the name of Jesus, the ultimate neighbour. Amen. Let us sing, joyful, joyful, we adore you. Welcome to worship on this chilly morning. Welcome to those who are gathered in this place and to others who are participating virtually from their homes or maybe viewing the service at a later time. All of you are welcome. Today we will read and reflect on one of the best known of Jesus' parables the one known as the Good Samaritan. And we'll also hear a message, a passage from the Old Testament prophet Amos, who, living long before Jesus, of course, warned the people that God would judge and punish them because they were no longer keeping God's law. They'd forgotten that God acts with love and mercy and calls us to do the same. It's also the last day of NAIDOC week. And it's appropriate we'll acknowledge that in the message. But as we gather for worship, we acknowledge that we're on the traditional country of the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation. And we pay respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. 
which continue to be important to the Wadawurrung people living today. Our prayer of confession has a, a response and it'll be followed as it usually is by the assurance of pardon. And then when I looked at the words we were saying in there, I thought it might be appropriate to sing a doxology afterwards. Praise God from whom all blessings flow to not the old tune, but another that's familiar. So when we come to that, you might, if you're able to stand for that doxology. And this prayer of a confession, it's probably almost more of a lament, thinking about you know, what is happening in the world, similar to what is ha was happening in Amos's time. How long, God, will our leaders mislead, our judges impede justice, and our peacekeepers disrupt? How long, how long, and how long will we stay supposed? How long, God, will children go hungry? Will women remain unsafe? Will queer folk be shamed? How long, how long? And how long will we stay How long, God, will fear reign? and ignorance flee, and greed guide. How long, how long? How long, God, will we turn from you? How long until we return to you? How long until we remember again? How long, how long? And how long will we stay silent? God hears our cry, our lament, our hope. God is the way through sorrow to life. Do not be afraid any longer, for God is here. God frees you from sorrow. God frees you into life. Stay silent no longer. Sing your freedom and share this gift of hope. to come forward.
it was? It was a bird that was lying there because it had been hurt. Maybe it had flown into something and it, its wing was broken so it couldn't fly, so it was lying there. And the little girl, she stopped it. Her mum was holding on to her, so she stopped her. She said, stop, look here. Look at this poor bird. We can help it. And mum said, well, I don't know. She probably said, go on. And everyone else was walking past, but they stopped and they picked up the bird. Maybe she had a, a scarf on and she shook that off and cradled the bird in her hands <coughs> and they took it home. And I think they found a little box and put it in and made sure it was comfortable and warm and fed it. What would you feed a bird? I wonder if it's like that. Bird seed, yeah. Maybe give it a little bit of water. Anyway, they looked after the bird for, I don't know how long, a little while, quite a few days, and it got better. Did you? This one wasn't quite dead. Anyway, so it got better. So they went back down to where they'd found the bird and released it, and it flew away. How to heal a broken wing. Lovely little story. Good to hear a story in church about a story that Jesus told about a man who was injured and someone who came and helped him. And there were other people who didn't come and help him. And But the man who came and helped him was someone they didn't expect. And Jesus told that. He said, well, we are called to, we meant to care to love. Sometimes we think following rules or doing other things, oh, maybe I'll miss me. I bet, yeah. <coughs> You're going over there. Yeah, but remember that story about love. And I think there are some pieces of paper with um, some activities that are based on that story too. The Good Samaritan. sing a song now that's about goodness being stronger than evil and it's called that just that goodness is stronger than evil
Our first reading comes from Amos, chapter 7, verse 7 to 17. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand, and the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will raise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very centre of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile, away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy in Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I'm no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I'm a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from the following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel, and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore thus says the Lord, your wife shall become a prostitute in the city, and your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword, and your land shall be parceled out by line. You yourself shall die in an unclean land, and Israel shall surely go into exile away from its land. Our second reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verse 25 to 37. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbour as yourself. And he said to him, You've given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbour? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers, who stripped him, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while travelling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took, and took care of him. Sorry. He went to him and bandaged all his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was the neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. In this is the word of the Lord. <coughs> I'm going to have a, a dialogue, a converse, it's a little bit imaginative, a conversation between a, a good lawyer and a good Samaritan 
you know, after the event, with the lawyer asking the Samaritan to account for himself. Um, Keith Lowe is the lawyer, David the Samaritan. Now, excuse me. Thank you, Father. I've been talking to that new rabbi outside. He's very interested in your case. Says I ought to look into it properly because then I'll understand what God's way is really about. I find it hard to believe. Seems to me you were very irresponsible. So, if I'm to take on your case, Help me. Your employers say that you messed about at an inn outside Jericho, thereby wrecking a deal at a delicate point. That you came back without the valuable samples of oil and wine you'd been provided with and claimed you'd used them to save a man's life. But you can't produce the man. Furthermore, the donkey assigned to you by the company has been misappropriated by you. The donkey was exhausted and the saddle cloth was all stained with blood when eventually it got back to the company stable. You need to do some explaining. And I can. Give me a chance. Okay. Just take me back to the beginning of the story. You were on your way to Jericho? On business? Yes, I, I travel there frequently. It's tiring. It's a, it's a rough road. Very dangerous. So, you fancied stopping off at an inn? Mm -hmm. Eating a little something, drinking a little something, reckless about the effect your delay would have on your employer's profits and on consumer confidence? You also ignored the need to meet your targets? No. I'm a careful, conscientious man. But some things are more important than profit, even more important than loyalty to my employers. It was like this. I was about halfway between Jerusalem and Jericho in a steep, rocky ravine. It was dark and desolate. I saw bones. The bones of a goat or perhaps a sheep it was hard to tell. But I tell you, it was scary. Even though I'd been through that pass many times before, I always felt it. Menace. Vultures overhead. And then, a hundred yards beyond the carcass, a man was lying by the road, dying. So you went to help him? Hmm? Was that a sensible thing to do in the midst of all that menace? Uh, I don't know about sensible, but it was the right thing to do. Was it? You're not paid to be a first aider. Hmm? nor a mountain rescue do-gooder. Where were your priorities? Where they ought to be. With seeing a wounded, probably without help, a dying man in front of me. He was very near the end, in a terrible, desolate place. The vultures were gathering. The stripped bones told their own story. He needed my help. At once. Nothing else mattered. Why didn't you just call for help? You had your phone. You think that would have worked? People can surprise you, even shock you. I've been watching as I crested the rise. <coughs> I could see quite a way ahead. I watched this chap approach. He looked like a vicar or something. Long black gown, you know. I saw him peer at the dead animal. Then he went on a bit and peered at what I thought then was some kind of old rubbish dumped there. He seemed to sniff, as if deploring people who chucked rubbish away in the pristine wilderness. Then he went on. And blow me, another bloke came into view then. He'd been behind a great pile of rocks at the foot of the cliff. He looked like a teacher of some sort. I mean, he was reading a book and scribbling in the margin with a pencil as he walked along as if he was preparing a lecture or something. I don't think he even saw the sheep. But he saw the man all right, because he stopped dead, then sidled away from him, pressing himself right against the rock face to avoid having 
to even look at him closely. So when I got up close and saw what both of them had seen, I knew that if he was going to get help, I would have to provide it. So yes, I did what I could and I used what I had to hand, the wine to clean and the oil to soothe. Yes, I used my employer's property. And yes, I took the time it needed, my employer's time if you insist on looking at it that way. And let's get it all out in the open. I put him on the donkey, the company donkey. I walked because he couldn't, not in the state he was in. I reckon it was mine to lend at that moment. You didn't think that if two respectable men had avoided him, you ought to do the same? After all, it says here they were both upstanding members of the local community. They really were a priest and a lecturer. I've got their testimony here, and it makes you look bad. The vicar was on his way to an important meeting. Loitering in the wilderness would have been a dangerous waste of time, he says. Anyhow, the man was dead, and you shouldn't interfere with the dead. But he wasn't dead. That's a plain lie. Well, then was he a fraud? Playing dead? No badly, badly wounded man has come forward. Ah, oh, give me a break. I'm not surprised he's gone. He was traumatised, battered, bruised, terrified out of his mind. I bet he disappeared as soon as he, he was able to get out of bed. I'd have done the same thing in his place. The teacher was on his way to class. He says he hesitated, but the man was probably a decoy one of the thieves, and perhaps you were in league with them. Even if you weren't, you were encouraging loungers and scroungers by throwing charity around. And if you weren't, well, colluding in feckless, even criminal behaviour and neglecting your employer's work and your duties as a citizen. It's almost incredible. But then he points out you're not a citizen. You're a foreigner. I quote, They're all alike, these immigrants. They look after their own. Guilty as charged, but he was one of my own. He was a fellow human being. I had to look after him. You've convinced me. That rabbi was right. Compassion has to be the first priority. Let's fight this one. I don't know, but perhaps you've come to grief in a public place so that, you know, in a best spot of bother, helpless, feeling maybe pain, embarrassment, you needed to rely on strangers to help and care for you. This is what happened, although it was much worse probably than we've experienced to the man who fell into the hands of robbers on that treacherous road between Jerusalem and Jericho. Because thugs robbed him and stripped him and beat him and then fled from the scene, leaving him bleeding and broken. And from this point on, the story is told really from the perspective of the victim. very anxious, lying there, hardly, hardly breathing. Can imagine him wondering, longing for someone to come and wondering what might happen, whether he could be saved. And when he saw the priest approaching, 
Surely, he thought, this is one of my own, a Jew. But the priest came and went, turning his head in disgust. He walked on. And then the Levite, a learned teacher, the wounded man got his hopes up yet again, but the Levite behaved much as the priest had, refused to see and care and feel and moved on. The third traveller was a Samaritan, although the injured man couldn't have known this at the time. And being a Samaritan, he wasn't simply a stranger, but someone whom the victim had been taught to shun, for Jews and Samaritans had nothing to do with each other. Jews regarded Samaritans as enemies, a different race, a lesser peoples. Maybe a bit like today we might regard criminals or drug addicts. <coughs> you know, people out there. But it's this despised Samaritan who stopped and cared and administered first aid, saving the man's life. This despised Samaritan was neighbour to the one who so needed him. And let me remind you why Jesus told this parable. A lawyer, a teacher in the faith, asked him one of those big questions. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Of course, this man knew that what was in God's law, for the law was his specialty. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbour as yourself. But who is my neighbour? he asked. Who are the people for whom I am required to care? <coughs> According to the law, a neighbour was a fellow Jew, one of his own. A neighbour was a sister or brother in the faith. But Jesus answered him by telling the parable. And then Jesus changed the lawyer's question by asking, which one of these three was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers. Which one of these? And the answer's clear. The dying man's neighbour was the one who acted and cared, the only one of the three who showed him mercy and love, the Samaritan. Rules and standards do have their place. That was the message of the prophet that Amos had spoken to the people in the 7th century BCE, where the level of lawlessness in the northern kingdom troubled him. And he shared with the people some of the oracles of dreams that came from God, including a dream about a plumb line being held in their midst to show, you know, that what they were doing was out of line. Corruption, greed, selfishness. Rules and standards help us to live together safely and to live in harmony. But rules can be discriminatory. And very often they favour one group over and against others. And sometimes when we apply rules, we rob others of their basic rights. Rules can get in the way of showing mercy. Today, the 10th of July, is the final day of NAIDOC Week, a celebration of the history and culture, resilience and achievements of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Our Uniting Church National President, Reverend Sharon Hollis, has said that NAIDOC Week is an opportunity to celebrate First Nations people, all they've achieved, all they've longed for. And the Uniting Church celebrates First Nations people at the heart of the Uniting Church. And we're invited to explore ways to live the covenant locally, to build on, you know, what we know now. But there was a time, and not so long ago, when Australians sought to dismiss the grief and hurt experienced by our Indigenous sisters and brothers. 
we have sadly closed our ears to racial slurs. Just as we may sometimes still close our eyes to abuse that's happening. We know that the Indigenous population is um, disproportionately represented in Australia's prisons. And whilst change is happening, it's not quickly enough and there's much more to be done to address this inequity. One day this week, I, was, I heard an ABC radio program and they were talking about the challenges faced by men and women who've been released from prison or have done time. And often their imprisonment was years ago. Learning to live outside can be tough for many reasons. But what they were often saying that their criminal record is never expunged. Even if they've been released a long, long time ago and never gone back inside. You know, even if they've been very different people now from when they made a mistake. Of course, there are a lot of criminals who seem impossible to rehabilitate and sadly go back and back into prison. And I'm not talking about them but there are others who are ready for a new life upon their release and don't want to look back. And these people find that if they're honest about their past, few businesses will want to employ them. And opportunities for volunteering in the community are also denied them. Yeah, we can understand why there are rules and standards and crim checks and working with children's checks and things. But we wonder where is the grace? Where is the love? Where is the trust? One person, one former prisoner, spoke on that radio program and he said he would really love to be able to volunteer to school groups, to go and speak to their assemblies and share his experience and urge students against making the mistakes he made in his youth. And because of his experience, he'd be uniquely placed to help to prevent crime. Maybe to get them to think differently. But the opportunity is denied him. And denied to the rest of us, I guess, too. He wants to be a neighbour, but is stopped by rules. Let's go back now to the Gospel. Jesus changed the lawyer's question by asking which one of these three was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers. So it is that the concept of neighbour shifts from a tag that we might apply to others to a quality of life that each of us is called to take on and live out. The neighbour isn't that one over there, but who we are, how we might live. And this is the way to inherit eternal life. The basis of our inheritance is the God whom we attempt to love with all our being, the God who loves the world and reaches out in compassion and calls us to do the same. God's ministry continues in and through the life of Jesus, enabled by the Spirit and through the grace and caring of servants and disciples today. It continues in those who care for their fellow humans as a means of addressing the world's hurts and needs. And you and I are called to be part of this ministry of compassion and love and grace and healing. Let us pray. God of justice and mercy, give us hearts of faithfulness, hearts that lead our hands in works of compassion. 
from your great love for us. Inspire us to love our neighbours. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let us sing, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. allow a, a time for some sharing and caring if you have any or notices. We've got the I was actually putting my hand up to make a notice. I can go around but yeah, I'll go we'll first. Um, I've just come back from the Synod gathering last weekend. Um, it's my first time getting to go to a Synod gathering very positive experience, definitely keen to um, go back again if I get the opportunity. Um, so we began with um, the Thursday night with um, our opening worship and the, um, the introduction of David Fotheringham as our new moderator. Um, and Synod then ran from the Friday through to the Sunday. Uh, we had some amazing Bible studies led by um, uh, Professor Sean Winter. Um, the theme was um, Arise, Come With Me, um, taken out of um, Song of Solomon, and there was lots of good conversations about sort of um, winter and spring in particular, or like particularly given this context of... Um, COVID and not being able to gather together for a synod in person for a, um, a few years. Um, one of the other major, um, I guess, legislations that we had to vote on was, um, I guess, applying uh, Victoria's policy on voluntary assisted dying to Tasmania, who were um, now coming up with a similar legislation for their state. And in the United Church, that's policy of it is allowable, but at our preference always remains um, 
good quality palliative care. Mm. Um, if anybody has any further questions about that, they are welcome to chat to me after the service. And I'll hopefully be able to remember a bit more as well. Who else had things they wanted to share? Good morning, everybody. Thank you, David, for that report. And um, it's great that you were willing to go and... He actually represents the presbytery um, in synod meetings, but at the same time, it's terrific that you were able to represent us at that meeting. Thank you. Um, I've been asked questions several times within the last week, and it's a bit like, um, where's Wally? Or where's the green sheep? Except that this one has been, where's Toupee? Where is Toupee? Toupee is okay. To explain the last three Sundays, the first of those Sundays, Toupee had his usual Sunday with the Samoan people in Melbourne. He was still working. Last Sunday was a Sunday off every quarter that all ministers are entitled to. This week is the only week that he has had off as part of his annual leave. And he made the very wise decision, and maybe he's listening at the moment, made the very wise decision to go to Sydney for the week for a bit of relaxation. And I had a, a few texts with him earlier in the week and he said, yes, it's raining. <laughs> so that explains um, two days' absence today. He will be back at work this week and back with us next week. And in the meantime, thank you very much to Lorraine twice and also to Dennis um, for leading us in worship over the past three Sundays. Thank you very much. One of the um, notices in the bulletin here somewhere, says that on the 24th of July, which is in two weeks' time, we will, um, after worship, there'll be an opportunity to put together some more care packages for Barwon Health. I'm not sure exactly, well, probably... Um, intensive care wards, but I'm not sure which other places. But we've heard that the, well, we know COVID is still around and the health workers are under growing mounting stress at the moment too. So it's a good time to get that back into, into focus. And also on, on that Sunday, I understand that um, we're going to recognise the tree of beanies and also the, the gifts gave, given to Lazarus House, the sort of giving, have it a giving Sunday, 24th of this month. Let us at this point um, make our offering to our work, to God's work in our area. The offering, offering will be received. Let us pray. 
God of grace and compassion. May our gifts enable your church to be a place where strangers become friends. Outcasts are welcomed. Seekers receive. And doubters find faith. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. With our prayers of the people this morning, chosen to, um, well, not so much to name some of the issues that are happening, and there's been a lot this week, you know, floods, the assassination of Shinzo Abe in Japan, the changes in the leadership of Great Britain's ministry, um, COVID challenges, a lot more huge amount that's happening. But to focus on the call to be neighbours and to show God's mercy each day. And there's a response in this prayer which is a sung <coughs> refrain. After each petition, please join me in singing the refrain of the, well it's a hymn, and it's the words, Yezu, Yezu, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbours we have from you. I don't know whether Alan will start it with a note or something like that. but yeah. And I think you're, not, you're familiar with that hymn. So let us pray. God of grace, we give you thanks for the many mercies of each day. For the kind word given freely. For the smile offered sincerely. For the simple moments when someone loves a neighbour. and pray for people who care for others. All of those whose compassionate attention to detail <coughs> enhances another's life. Understanding of being a neighbour. We give thanks for what we receive freely from others who choose to be a neighbour to us, despite differences that may stand between us. We pray for a greater understanding and awareness that everyone is our neighbour. thanks for every opportunity to be a neighbour to others. We pray for justice for those who are mistreated by the people around them. we've yet to walk, the journey still to undertake. May we find our neighbour at every turn and accept the ongoing surprise of your gospel in the neighbourhood of your reign.
join me in praying together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And let us sing the pilgrim's song. Go and do likewise, Jesus tells us. Do like the one who tended a stranger's wounds and turn them both to neighbours. May it be Jesus you meet, the spirit who heals and the life of the creator that we receive. Amen. We sing shalom to you. Amen. 